Hello everyone and welcome to this ICTV lecture on tax administration and tax compliance in low-income countries. This lecture has three parts. In the first one, uh, I will give you an introduction to tax administration and taxpayer compliance in low-income countries. In the second part, Giovanni Occhiali will talk about the history and political economy of tax administration and tax policy in low-income countries. And in the third part, Fabrizio Santoro will talk about data technology and tax administration. Welcome to this lecture on the introduction to tax administration and taxpayer compliance in low-income countries. I would like to start uh, this part of the lecture with a very basic question. What is tax administration? Well, when we refer to tax administration, we typically think about a government agency or department which is in charge of collecting taxes and organizing the tax paying process. But tax administrations are also supposed to do that in a way that is equitable, efficient and at the lowest possible cost to both taxpayers and the tax administration itself. How are tax administrations typically organized? They are typically segmented across taxpayer types. So they typically have an office for large taxpayers, one for medium and small taxpayers. And that is different to being organized around uh, tax types. So in the past, some tax administrations were organized uh, so that they had, for example, an office uh, dealing with indirect taxes, the retail uh, sales tax, for example, or the corporate income tax, so that taxpayers had to go to different offices depending on what tax type they were dealing with at a, at a specific time. So uh, there was a switch over time between an organization uh, around tax types uh, to an organization around taxpayer types, so that now taxpayers only have to deal with one office and that office will deal with all the different tax types that they are uh, usually paying. Revenue administrations in many parts of Africa are semi-autonomous revenue authorities or SARAs. What this means is that they are autonomous from other government uh, entities and particularly the Ministry of Finance. They still report to the Ministry of Finance and we'll discuss in a second more about the distinctions between revenue authorities and ministries of finance. But they are autonomous in the sense that, for example, they have their own staff, they can organize themselves separately from other government departners, departments, and particularly they sometimes have uh, different salary scales. So it, um, we see sometimes that tax officials can be paid a slightly higher uh, salaries than other government officials. And that is due to the need to attract the right kind of talent for the very specific knowledge about taxes that is required in a tax administration but also uh, to reduce the incentives uh, for tax officials to engage in corruption and illicit activities in their interactions with taxpayers. The key functions of a revenue administration are audit and investigation to make sure that evasion is both detected and prosecuted, a range of taxpayer services, uh, for example, tax administrations will have a call center that taxpayers can call if they have questions, they will have various uh, forms of support to taxpayers during the declaration period, for example. They will manage payments, tax payments, they will manage data coming from the tax declarations themselves, they will develop IT solutions and carry out a number of measures around um, taxpayer education and sensitization that can really range from seminars for specific groups of taxpayers in specific sectors um, and, for example, taxpayer appreciation days, uh, which are events that typically uh, run over a number of days, so they're more a series of events rather than just a day. And the main aim is really to appreciate uh, taxpayers' contributions to both the public purse, but also national development more generally. How can tax administrations be evaluated? Uh, there are tools that are international. For example, uh, TADAT is the Tax Administration Diagnostic Assessment Tool. It was developed by a group of development partners and partner countries um, with the aim of developing a standardized tool that could be applied across countries so that tax administrations across countries can be compared uh, to each other and the performance can also be compared um, across countries. So TADAT includes, for example, uh, nine performance areas ranging from uh, accountability and transparency, uh, to the effect effective risk management, to the integrity of the registered taxpayer's base. Each of those nine performance areas will uh, have indicators that are quantified in regular assessments carried out in country. 
But revenue authorities also have their own uh, performance criteria. Um, it's worth mentioning one uh, because it's uh, something that recent research has been showing as being particularly relevant and sometimes problematic. Many revenue authorities use the number of new taxpayers um, as a key performance criteria to evaluate the actions of the revenue administration. And the reason why I said this can be problematic is that expanding the number of taxpayers without really um, understanding their needs, uh, their relations with the taxpaying process can be counterproductive in two ways. One is those taxpayers, especially when they are very small or even micro taxpayers, they might actually not yield much revenue. So expanding the number of taxpayers doesn't necessarily mean expanding revenue, but also it can uh, have unintended consequences uh, on their perceptions around the tax system. And we'll discuss this a bit more uh, in the next uh, slides. I want to make a distinction now between tax administration and tax policy. And this is a distinction that um, anybody who has to do with taxation hears about a lot. So typically uh, you have the Ministry of Finance setting tax policy and the tax administration or your semi-autonomous revenue administration, uh, revenue authority, SARA, collecting and administering taxes. They also do different jobs in principle. Uh, so uh, tax policymakers typically write and revise laws. Uh, so they set tax rates. They define what is the tax base. In federal countries with multiple levels, levels of government, they assign tax powers to those different levels of government. The tax administration, on the other hand, um, has a uh, role to make sure that the tax paying process runs smoothly. So uh, tax administrators normally check that declarations are filed in a timely and accurate way. Uh, they make sure that the tax base is as comprehensive as it should be according to the laws. So they, they do different jobs. Uh, they have concerns and challenges that are slightly different. Um, so for example, tax policymakers will be concerned with changing and updating rates. Um, they will be concerned about adopting new taxes and generating the legal framework around those. Uh, oftentimes they are involved in exemptions, uh, but also they will be required ministries of finance to coordinate multiple institutions that are often involved in the practicality of tax policy. Usually you have the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Investment, the Ministry of Planning and the Revenue Authority all having some role in, uh, uh, in tax policy. The Minister of Finance is also typically concerned with ensuring balance across levels of government, but also ensuring macro stability in the country and budget discipline. The tax administration has related but quite different sets of concerns. It is concerned with administrative capacity. So does the government have enough capacity to actually follow up on the laws and make sure they are implemented? It is concerned with increasing compliance. This is perhaps the biggest challenge and the biggest concern of tax administrations, which is why we are discussing them today um, alongside one another. It is concerned with corruption uh, in, in the taxpaying process and the way the tax administration ensures uh, that taxpayers comply. So these are sets of concerns that are very uh, related, obviously, but slightly different. One phrase that one comes across uh, quite often in this field is that tax administration is tax policy. So despite the differences in um, the key actors, the job that they do, the typical concerns and functions that they have, still tax administration is tax policy. And what this means is that administrative practices affect how policy happens in practice. And I'll give you a couple of examples to really show what this means. The first example is about effective tax rates. Um, and I'm going to use some evidence from corporate income tax in Ethiopia, which is the graph you have on the left, and value added tax uh, in Rwanda, which is the graph you have on the right. So for both tax types, CIT and VIT, the statutory rate is proportional and it is the same for everyone. So for example, CIT in Ethiopia is levied at 30% uh, of taxable income for all businesses. And VAT uh, in Rwanda is levied at 18% uh, for all firms. There are obviously some reduced rates and zero rates uh, and exemptions uh, on both. 
but the standard rate is the same for everyone. In practice, when we go and look at the effective tax burden, so how much firms actually pay divided by their turnover or their gross profits, uh, the exact definitions you will find in the uh, two uh, papers that are cited here at the bottom of each graph, when you look at the effective tax burden, what you see in those graphs is that uh, firms that are closer to the zero or one in the horizontal axis, which are the lower income groups, actually face a higher tax burden than those who are more towards the uh, nine or 10 in the horizontal axis, which are the higher income groups. So although the tax rates are proportional and they're the same for everyone, and this is what is set out in tax policy, the way those taxes are implemented and the complex interactions between the tax administration, the way the tax administration implements tax laws and the way taxpayers engage with the tax paying process results in a higher tax burden for smaller taxpayers, both for CAT and VAT in those two cases I'm presenting you from Rwanda and Ethiopia. And again, all the details of those uh, analyses are available in the relevant papers. The second example of what tax administration is tax policy means in practice um, is the example of taxing higher income groups. So when we think about uh, the largest tax gaps in low-income countries, uh, one useful exercise one can do um, is to compare tax ratios for specific tax types between higher income and lower income countries. So the graph that you see there on the slide does exactly that. So this um, is the ratio of the tax ratio for a specific tax type in a high income country divided by the tax ratio of the corresponding tax type in, a low, in low income countries. So when that ratio is one, it means that uh, the tax ratio for, for example, CIT in high income countries divided by the tax ratio for CIT in low income countries is pretty much the same. So that is what the graph is telling you for CIT. Where you see the biggest gaps is PIT and property tax. Uh, so for PIT, what this graph is telling you is that the tax ratio for personal income taxes is about three times as big in high income countries than it is in low income countries. For, personal, for uh, property taxes, the gap is even more uh, wide actually. So you have at least a 10% gap, which is what the blue bar is telling you, uh, when you consider a comparison between high income countries and low and lower mi middle income countries. So high income countries collect 10 times as much property taxes than low and lower middle income countries, even once you take ratios as a share of GDP. Of course, the absolute value of those uh, tax collections will be much more different, but by taking a uh, ratio to GDP, we can at least put those numbers uh, in relation to the size of the economy. And still, there are big gaps, particularly in personal income taxes and property taxes. So what does this tell us? This tells us that probably the biggest gaps are really amongst higher income groups. Uh, we know that property is a major way to store wealth in low income countries. And we also know that personal income taxes are collected quite ineffectively. Uh, and I'm thinking particularly about taxes on capital gains, on rental income, on professionals' income and professionals who are often um, self-employed um, uh, and who often fail to uh, declare altogether or when they declare, they're very likely to underreport their incomes. And these are the higher income groups for which there is likely to be quite a big gap. Importantly, this is not a gap in policy. The laws exist, it's a gap in enforcement. And this is a very good example where tax administration is tax policy because uneven enforcement and difference in the tax administration's effectiveness in taxing different groups seriously affects the overall equity of the tax system, notwithstanding tax policy. So the tax laws are there, but the way they are implemented unevenly across groups generates differences, uh, different outcomes uh, in, the, in the application of that tax policy. So against that background, um, I want to highlight a few of the challenges in tax administration. And of course, the key goal of tax administration in low income countries is to increase tax collection. That is the paramount goal and the key challenge that they, that they have. Uh, often tax collection is measured as the tax to GDP ratio. Um, and I'm gonna come back to this uh, in the next slide and show you some figures. 
Often to increase tax collections, what tax administrations should do is increase and maintain taxpayer compliance. Now, there is a prevailing narrative uh, that one of the key things that tax administrations should do uh, to increase compliance is to expand the tax net to the informal sector. And of course, there is some truth in that, um, in the sense that it's only fair that everyone is uh, registered for taxes and pays what they are supposed to pay according to the law. What we have been doing at the ICTD um, is really challenging that narrative and uh, uh, making, it, um, making the arguments a little bit more nuanced. Uh, and the reason is the following, that when a tax administration is very focused on expanding tax to the informal sector, what it ends up doing um, is chasing the, res the registration of a lot of small and micro firms that get into the tax net, get registered with the revenue authority, but have very little knowledge about what is it that they should be doing to actually engage in the tax paying process. The result is often that uh, they bring very little revenue because anyway, they are very small uh, or micro firms. And we know that tax revenue in low income countries particularly is highly concentrated amongst the higher income groups. So it is very common to see, for example, the large taxpayers office contributing 70 or 80% of total revenue. But it's not only about the little revenue that they bring. It's also that sometimes those taxpayers who are brought into the tax net uh, through sometimes aggressive registration campaigns, they end up either not filing their tax, their tax returns or filing what we call nil returns. So they file, they, they report zero under all headings of their tax declaration. That means zero income, zero costs, zero taxes. So all this effort to expand the tax base in this sense actually yields very little revenue and it might even be counterproductive because those small taxpayers brought into the tax net without clear information about the, what they should be doing and sometimes even without having to be in the tax net actually might develop uh, worse perceptions about uh, the fairness uh, of uh, the tax paying process and the professionalism of the revenue administration itself. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be taxing uh, the informal sector at all. In fact, there are sections of the informal sector that are a lot more profitable than those small and micro enterprises. The informal sector really is a concept that spans across uh, business size um, and um, it includes, for example, uh, those self-employed professionals I mentioned before, but also quite a few higher income individuals that uh, are not in the tax net at all. So expanding the tax base perhaps should focus on those higher income um, groups uh, with much more revenue potential than the uh, lower income groups that don't have much revenue potential, uh, but also where it's a lot harder to figure out who should be registered, who shouldn't, and what should happen when they are registered in terms of provision of information and uh, facilitation of compliance. And we'll come back to those themes later. Um, in, related to what I just mentioned about small businesses, another key challenge of tax administrations is uh, related to compliance costs and taxpayer confusion. So I just mentioned how small taxpayers are often confused about their tax obligations. They're of, often confused about processes uh, that they encounter as they submit their declarations, as they prepare their declarations, as they are audited if they are audited. But also all those processes represent costs for taxpayers both uh, administrative costs, financial costs, if they have to hire, for example, an accountant. And it is a key challenge and a key goal of the tax, tax administration to actually reduce those costs and make it easy for taxpayers to comply. Of course, all of this is made a lot harder uh, by poor access to and quality of public services uh, in low-income countries. So we know that in the typical uh, low-income countries, public services are uh, of lower quality and less accessible to uh, the wider population, which affects uh, especially fiscal exchange. So uh, how much citizens will be willing to pay their taxes in exchange of public services. Then, of course, revenue administrations uh, work within the economic structure of the country. So typically low income countries have uh, larger agricultural sectors and smaller manufacturing sectors, uh, therefore making it harder to actually collect taxes because typically it is harder to collect taxes in the agricultural sector than it is in, for example, the manufacturing sector. Data and technology is both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, it is an opportunity for obvious reasons and uh, this will be 
the subject of a separate part of, of uh, this lecture. Uh, but also tapping the full potential is quite hard because of limited uh, administrative capacity in tax administration. Now, against those challenges, one might ask, um, so are low-income countries making progress? And to do that, what we often use is the tax-to-GDP ratio. So when you look at the tax-to-GDP ratio uh, in low-income countries uh, versus high-income countries, the difference is quite stark. So you have 13% as opposed to 23% in 2018. And this data comes from the um, ICTD UN wider government revenue data set, which is uh, publicly available uh, online. Um, so those numbers I just mentioned, 13% and 23%, they are about total tax. If you were to look at total revenue, including non-tax revenue in addition to tax, you would have slightly higher numbers. So you would have 16% uh, for low-income countries and 40% for high-income countries which uh, largely reflects non-tax revenues like social, contrib social security contributions, for example. Now, what do these numbers tell us? Um, well, there is this uh, figure of about 15 or 20 percent, it depends on, on, on the papers, that is seen as a minimum to have a functioning government that can fund basic government functions. So low-income countries by this standard seem to have less revenue than needed to have a functioning government because the tax ratios, whether you take total revenue or total tax, are below that 15-20%, uh, that is the minimum required. But then we can look at the evolution over time, which is what the graph does uh, here on the slide, and see if tax ratios, um, how tax ratios uh, evolved over time. And what you see there is four lines for low income, lower middle income, upper middle income and high income countries. And they are exactly in this order. So you see lower uh, income countries uh, towards the bottom of the graph and higher income countries um, towards the top uh, of the graph. So looking at those lines, you might think they actually look pretty flat. So you might be discouraged and think there hasn't been uh, quite as much progress as, as I'd like to see. But actually in low income countries, what you see in the past 10 years is a 30% growth in, uh, in the tax to GDP ratio, which, uh, which isn't, isn't bad at all especially considering that um, tax to GDP ratios are very hard to change much year on year. And in fact, in countries where we see large changes from one year to another, we also usually see um, a um, going back on that progress in the following years. So it's very hard to sustain large changes in the tax to GDP ratio over time. So one could look at this graph and particularly the bottom line, which is the one for uh, low income countries, and think, well, there's actually been a, uh, you know, a gradual but sustained increase in the tax to GDP ratio. And it is actually a good thing that those improvements have been consolidating over time uh, and they have um, provided a, a good ground for more improvements uh, in the tax to GDP ratio. So um, the tax to GDP ratio could tell a positive or, or a more pessimistic story. Uh, but it only really goes that far because it doesn't tell us anything about uh, how tax revenue is collected. And there is where there's been a lot of progress in, in low-income countries particularly. Um, low-income countries have adopted uh, digitized data and technology at a very high speed. They have adopted modern approaches to tax administration. The VAT is a tax that has been expanding massively in, um, in African countries and developing countries more generally. They have undergone institutional reforms, like for example, the creation of SARAs that I mentioned before. So all of this is not captured really in the tax to GDP ratio to the extent that some of those changes might not result in immediate uh, changes in tax revenue. So uh, I guess what this, what I want to, um, the key message here is that too much attention on the how much of tax revenue, which is what the tax to GDP ratio measures, might actually distract attention away from the how tax revenue is raised, which in many ways is, is at least as important as the, uh, as the how much. And this includes uh, equity of the tax system, accountability of the tax system, the trust the citizens have in government and particularly in revenue administrations. And all this doesn't have an immediate revenue implication, but in the long term, it really sets the basis for a strong and uh, sustained uh, increases in revenue. 
So how can revenue administrations uh, improve tax compliance against the challenges that we just discussed and against the progress uh, that, uh, that I've just discussed in the last slide? There are really three main categories of things that tax administration should be doing. And, it's not, uh, and these are not alternatives, they usually happen at the same time. The first one is enforcement. Um, so enforcement is a cornerstone of any tax administration across the world. Um, it remains the most important activity that uh, tax administrations do. And this has to do with audits, with sanctions, with checks, any way to uh, detect and punish tax evasion. Although enforcement is obviously very important for tax administration, audit rates are meant to remain low and it is not feasible nor desirable to actually check every taxpayer, just the same way that it's not feasible to have a police officer at every corner in a city, it is not possible to check tax declarations for every firm uh, in a country. In fact, audit rates are typically only 1 or 2% uh, or lower for most taxpayers, so only 1 in 100 taxpayers is actually audited uh, when we consider small taxpayers. Those rates are higher for larger taxpayers because these are the ones where uh, a lot of revenue can be generated and usually revenue administrations uh, focus their efforts on the larger taxpayers. But most taxpayers will not receive an audit in their, in their lifetime. And this is true for low income countries and for higher income countries. The second element uh, of improving tax compliance is facilitation. And this has to do with the compliance costs I mentioned before. Uh, facilitating compliance means reducing compliance costs, and those compliance costs are administrative, psychological and financial. And facilitation is particularly important in low-income countries uh, because recently, um, recent research has documented very low uh, tax knowledge, uh, to the extent that many taxpayers don't even know which tax types they register for. So they find it really hard to engage with the tax paying process, to comply with their tax obligations because they're not aware of um, of their obligations and of the key elements of the tax system. On top of that, compliance costs are typically regressive, so they're higher for smaller firms than they are for uh, larger firms. So key functions related to facilitation uh, have to do with customer services and communication, uh, with the development of digital tools and IT solutions that can make it easier for taxpayers to comply. For example, some countries have adopted uh, M tax declarations, where small taxpayers uh, can file the declarations directly from their uh, mobile phones. The third element in improving tax compliance is trust. And this is part of the broader tax morale concept, which also includes fairness, tra transparency and accountability, all of which ultimately affect how much taxpayers trust the revenue authority to uh, do their job equitably in collecting taxes, but also trust the broader government in using those revenue in a way that is beneficial to uh, the whole population. And this um, element of trust clearly has links with the broader fiscal and government system. It has links with public services that are funded by taxes and which, with how much trust taxpayers have uh, that governments will make choices that are um, consistent with their beliefs and their preferences um, and that it will benefit them ultimately. So here um, key functions are internal control on corruption, the promotion of professionalism of uh, tax officials but also a broader government staff and sensitization about the importance of tax paying. Now what works best in practice? Um, I've just discussed uh, enforcement, facilitation, trust, what should revenue administrations do and what is it that is more likely to, uh, to work. So there's a huge literature, lots of research has been done um, on this. Uh, a lot of this literature actually focused on high income countries, a lot less in low income countries, but there's increasing evidence also from low income and African countries. So we can draw some um, initial considerations based on this. Um, in this slide, uh, I'm focusing particularly on nudging studies. Um, what they are uh, is essentially, uh, they're essentially studies using messages that are sent out to taxpayers that highlight specific drivers of compliance. So for example, you might have one message that highlights sanctions uh, and warns taxpayers that if they don't comply, they will be liable for sanctions. You might have one message highlighting how taxes are really important to fund public services that are beneficial for everyone, uh, really touching upon that trust um, element. 
and those different messages are sent to different taxpayers in an experimental setting, uh, meaning in a setting uh, similar to a randomized control trial or an actual randomized control trial. And what that means is that um, as a methodology that allows for rigorous, rigorous evaluation of those different drivers uh, of compliance on actual compliance behavior. So the interesting thing about those studies is that they look at actual taxpaying behavior as observed in the tax declarations of taxpayers. So typically taxpayers, um, we receive a message from the local revenue administration, not from researchers. Uh, and that's why often researchers collaborate, collaborate very closely with the local revenue administration. They will receive those messages around the declaration deadline. Uh, and uh, the idea is that then um, through the data in the tax declarations, it will be possible to observe shifts in compliance that might tell us if deterrence, for example, or enforcement is uh, more or less effective than uh, messages related to trust. So after this methodological note, uh, what do these studies tell us? Um, they tell us that deterrence seems to be a very strong driver of compliance. Uh, so typically, uh, taxpayers respond to messages related to deterrence, related to sanctions, to the probability of being detected evading. But it can also backfire. Um, so especially for larger taxpayers, receiving messages on deterrence can actually discourage them to comply uh, and it can crowd out intrinsic motivations to comply related to, for example, to uh, fairness and, uh, and to equity. Friendly approaches to taxpayers and simple reminders can be very effective. Uh, this is another key result of this uh, literature, actually, um, suggesting that facilitation plays a key role. So simply sending a message reminding taxpayers what is the de uh, declaration deadline um, actually makes a big difference in the extent they comply, which suggests that some taxpayers actually either forget the declaration deadline, um, don't remember it, or anyway appreciate a helpful role of the tax administration. On tax morale and trust, the results uh, are a bit more mixed. So some studies find that it is very effective, some studies find no effect uh, of those elements. But that, that does not amount to um, a case for the ineffectiveness of trust. Um, there's obviously also limitations to what the method can do. So these are only short messages. They're often delivered either by SMS or letter. Um, so it's not, it's not conclusive really on, on any of those things, but particularly on tax morale, where maybe a bit more is needed that goes beyond uh, a, a simple message. Importantly, those um, studies specifically and the broader literature really um, leaves some open questions. Uh, one is about uh, the credibility of the deterrence threats in the context of weak enforcement. So, uh, yes, the Revenue Administration can send out messages highlighting sanctions, but if those are not followed up by um, actual enforcement activities, there's a limit to what those messages can do. Um, and in fact, it can even backfire if those messages start um, being seen as not really being credible uh, and maybe with repercussions on the credibility of the tax administration itself. So it seems clear that um, any nudges or messages or any sort of communication really needs to come with both um, traditional forms of, of enforcement, so of actual enforcement like checks and audits, but also to with real measures to improve facilitation and trust. So a message that highlights um, the importance of taxes to fund public services is unlikely to do much if citizens don't actually see those public services and don't appreciate their value in their real life. There's also a question about the longer term effect. So most of those studies really only look at the first year in which the message is received. And the studies that look at multiple years um, show that there is very little effect on learning. So it's really more of a nudge. It's not, there's not much learning ongoing. So there is certainly a role for deeper interventions um, and there's certainly a role for uh, taxpayer education that goes beyond a specific uh, piece of information in a message, uh, but for example, is structured around training programs for taxpayers, um, which might uh, actually uh, help reducing their compliance costs and their confusion uh, with respect to the taxpaying process. So um, as a summary uh, of uh, this introduction, um, tax administration is a very complex business. It is about increasing revenue, but it's also doing that while ensuring equity, minimizing distortions, keeping costs low for the tax administration and taxpayers. Uh, doing all of this together is not easy. 
It's even less easy in a context of weak capacity, scarce resources, high staff turnover in revenue administration, and in a context where the way tax administration is um, implemented uh, and in the way tax administration happens really affects the outcomes of tax policy. So this is all very complex. Still, there has been much progress being done so far in low-income countries. In fact, low-income countries today uh, are doing a lot better than high-income countries when they had a very similar level of development. Um, they have implemented major innova innovations quite quickly. Uh, SARAs, VAT, digitized data and technology, those are all been, um, have all been implemented uh, with a rather impressive uh, speed and, um, uh, and very effectively in many cases. Said that, uh, there's of course still several challenges and they will take time to be tackled. So these are not challenges that can be addressed from one year to another or there's no quick fixes really. Um, those challenges are still a uh, large informal sector at all levels. So not only about small firms, but also higher income groups, uh, both individuals and firms. Um, a weak compliance culture, uh, weak administrative capacity, and often um, uncertain support for bold tax reforms. But also there are challenges related to the uh, way tax administrations are organized internally uh, and how accountable they are. Um, so for example, professionalism and performance of tax officials, the effectiveness of internal processes and the transparency of those processes, as well as transparency of how tax revenue is spent. Those are all things that where there's still uh, Quite a bit of progress to be made in many countries. Finally, improving taxpayer compliance, which is one of the key challenges that tax administrations will continue to face, not only in low-income countries, but really in any uh, country. Improving taxpayer compliance requires a mix of enforcement, faci facilitation and trust along the lines that we uh, have just discussed. And the exact mix of those three elements and specific actions will depend on the specific context. So thank you very much. Uh, I remain available uh, for questions um, and I look forward to hopefully uh, meeting you in person. Hello everyone. My name is Giovanni Occhiali and I am a research fellow at the International Center for Tax and Development. In this part of the lecture, we will look at the history and the political economy of tax policy and tax administration in low-income countries. So, when we consider how tax policy and tax administration have evolved over time in low-income countries, the influence of two factors is of particular importance. The first is how the role of the state in the development process was conceptualized. Should the state be very active in shaping economic outcome, or should it only guarantee the existence of private property and other type of rights? The second one is how the role of the tax system itself was intended. Should it only provide revenue for the state or should it also contribute to redistribution of income within the country? Now, these views were not only relevant at the domestic level, but also the international one. Theories that were developed in the global north had an impact in how low-income countries thought about the development of their own tax system through technical and financial assistance that was provided by our income countries and by international financial institutions. Both of these concepts, the, the role of the state in the development process and the role of the tax system within, uh, within the state, are still very important in shaping tax policies nowadays. Uh, there are different ways to raise more revenue. Uh, if we think about improving compliance, a revenue authority can either increase its outreach on activities or it, uh, or it can increase the number of audit it runs. Could clearly do both as well, but usually you know, financial resources are not uh, enough to pursue every potential avenue which is, which is available. Uh, similarly, if the target is to expand the tax net, then a revenue authorities could target the informal sector or it could target high net worth individual. Again, it could do both, but there might be reason why this is complex to do within the same time period. Uh, 
uh, which of these strategies will be pursued doesn't depend only on the financial and technical feasibility of each potential reform avenue, but also on the internal politics of the revenue authority itself. And now the general relationship between government and citizen shapes the tax system. So let's have a look about uh, how the historical evolution of the tax system and tax policies have looked like in low income countries. Uh, during colonial times, uh, there were both modern form of tax system and purely extractive ones. In the former, the modern ones, uh, taxes were levied in some proportion on a base whose economic value could be assessed. And this could have included a differentiation on tax rates on the characteristic of an asset so that you know, a more productive field could have been taxed more heavily than a less productive field, even if they had the same dimension. Uh, furthermore, uh, the resources that were levied through taxation uh, were generally used to provide some form of services, at least to some of the cities. Um, in purely extractive uh, revenue system, on the other end, uh, taxes were generally levied in a highly regressive way. All of the revenue was simply accruing to the governing bodies and there wasn't any type of service that was provided to the population. Uh, these type of taxes could have been, you know, hot taxes or poll taxes and generally were highly disliked by the population. Uh, modern form of tax administration were more common in settler colonies, those in which there was a substantial share of the population that was coming from the colonizing country. Where purely extractive tax systems were more common in areas in which colonial powers only maintained a minor control over a fraction of the country, usually a little more than the capital city. Um, much, much of these, much of these purely extractive systems were actually very common across the majority of sub-Saharan Africa, excluding a few countries in, in Southern Africa, such as South Africa and, and Zimbabwe. Um, in these second type of colonies, those that were uh, that were characterized by a purely extractive tax system, uh, taxes were generally highly unpopular with all the colonial subjects, as the funds extracted were extracted in a highly regressive way, and they got absolutely nothing in returns for for the uh, funds that that were paid in taxes. Now, as independence movement emerged and eventually became successful throughout many low-income countries, post-independence governments found themselves inheriting tax systems that were set up by the colonial powers for their own benefit and weren't really geared towards providing funds for, for the national development aspiration that many post-independence governments had. At the same time, they also had a population which was generally highly resistant to the concept of taxation due to the previous colonial experiences with levying taxes. However, at the same time, many of these governments saw the use of reforming the tax system as they could have been very useful in spurring economic development, in providing more services to their citizens, and also in reducing inequalities within their countries. This perception of the tax system as a useful tool was informed by the general view of the role of the tax system that was evolving in many industrialized countries in the post-war period, where taxes were used to give rise to the modern welfare states. Specifically, over these periods in many low-income countries, the focus of post-independence government was on the establishment of progressive direct taxes on different forms of income, which were seen as the backbone of income redistribution between the countries and potential and important contributor to public revenue, as well as the uh, levying of high taxes on agricultural products and raw materials, which were historically the main export from low-income countries and that were at the time experiencing an international boom, therefore commanding high prices. Finally, there was uh, generally the intention of charging high tariffs on industrial import in order to protect the national industrial sector, which many low-income countries' government wanted to establish. Now, 
while the strategies was somehow successful in increasing revenue in many low-income countries, the revenue raise was not enough to cover for the national expenditures, so that many governments borrowed in international markets the additional funds that were required to develop infrastructure and provide service to the citizens. This eventually led to adapt fuel growth, and when the second oil shock hit uh, the global economy in the late 70s and in the early 1980s, in conjunction with a slump in agricultural and commodity prices, many low-income countries found themselves unable to pay the loan that they had already taken out. In order to secure uh, much needed funding from international financial institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank, uh, many low income countries had to agree to a restructuring of their tax system, which had to be brought in line uh, with the international standards of the time. Given that both the IMF and the World Bank uh, are located in Washington, the general strategy that this institution proposed got to be known as the Washington Consensus. Uh, in this period of time, uh, the prevailing economic theory in the global north saw taxes as a measure that were uh, often distorting prices and impeding the correct functioning of, of economic markets, uh, which were thought to be uh, more capable of delivering growth if left unhindered by any type of government intervention. This was generally a period in which uh, the state, the role of the state in, in the running of the economy was thought to be minimal. The only things that the government had to do was guaranteeing the existence of property rights and generally the rule of law and guaranteeing the correct, the correct functioning of markets rather than guiding development itself. If markets were to be left unchecked, uh, then they would have been able to, to, deliver, to deliver economic growth to the whole of the country. As a consequence, the focus of tax policy reform in this period was mostly geared towards the reduction of both import tariff and export taxes, which were up to this point, the main source of income for the majority of low income countries. The fall in tax revenue from this trade liberalization was to be balanced by the introduction of value added taxes that was to be applied on more or less all economic transactions that were taking place in the country in order to broaden the tax base and balance the reduction of revenue from, from import tariffs and export taxes. Another thing that came under assault uh, was the strong progressivity of, of direct taxes that had prevailed up to that point. Uh, this, this setup of, of direct taxes in a highly progressive manner was seen as, as depressing the, uh, the growth of the entrepreneurial class in this country and favoring the, um, the remaining of much of the population in, in informal agricultural sector that was usually not subjected to uh, the same type of taxation as, as other sector of the economy. Now, by the 1990s, it became clear that the strategies that had been forced onto low income countries had actually led to a decrease in public revenue rather than an increase in public revenue without actually leading to a much better functioning of, of many of the markets in this country. Furthermore, the general international environment uh, had, had gone through a big change after the fall of the Soviet Union, so that the role of the state in spurring development was going through a general rethinking. Uh, this was not the time in which any state intervention was seen as detrimental anymore, and much more attention was dedicated to the quality of state institution and their effect on the development process. In the realm of taxation, uh, this implied a focus on the actual setup of tax administration within low-income countries. Uh, there was a strong push for the creation of semi-autonomous revenue authorities that were separated from ministries of finance, uh, and they were thought to make uh, tax administration more cost-effective, as well as less subject to uh, political pressure to lower tax rates just before the election or targeting particular sector of the economy for, for taxation. Um, 
Furthermore, uh, in line with the view of government as a service provider within the economy, tax administration was to become more customer oriented and tax authority had to strive uh, to make complying with tax obligation as easy as possible. Uh, much attention was also directed uh, to understand which taxes were underperforming in the portfolio of different tax handles that every country had, and this was done through the estimation of tax gaps, uh, so that you could actually see what was the difference between the theoretical capacity and the actual collection for each specific tax. Uh, the idea was to direct efforts uh, to increase tax collection uh, towards the tax handles uh, in which these efforts could have been more successful at a lower cost. Now, uh, the current approach uh, to tax reform in low-income countries uh, emerges from that of, of the early 2000s uh, and generally recognizes that you know, grand theories uh, that were promoting simple standard solutions in, across all low-income countries never fully delivered on, on their promises. And that what works and does not work uh, as well as why something does or does not work in any given context uh, will depend on the, specific, on the specificity of, of each given country. Uh, during this period, uh, empirical research grounded in the specific reality of, of each given country is becoming more common. And equally, the use of tax administration data to answer specific and well-defined micro question is becoming one of the norm in, in thinking about what type of, of tax reform should be promoted. Uh, much of the current focus uh, is then directed to understanding the political process of bargaining between state and citizen, uh, which underpin any type of, of tax reform as well as uh, the different underlying motive, motives uh, behind uh, low taxpayer compliance uh, with their tax obligation and the effectiveness of different strategies to tackle this low compliance. Um, furthermore, the development of strategies to tackle uh, institutional, institutional, international capital mobility and the development of the digital economy are, are becoming more prominent as it's very important given the current structure of the global economy to ensure that multinational corporations pay their fair share of taxes. Now, notwithstanding the specificity of each low-income country tax system, is there something general that we can say about their tax structure? Well, there's, there's a few things. So in many cases, uh, the typical revenue structure entails a high reliance on VAT, uh, which is very often the most important tax handle and source of revenue uh, within a country. At the same time, we can see a continuing importance of trade taxes. Uh, they are much more important in low-income countries than they are in high-income countries, although at the same time, they are much less important now than what they used to be in the 1970s. Uh, also, a common characteristic is a narrow base of, of uh, direct income taxes. Uh, PYE, pay as you earn, which is levied on formal employment income, is generally the most important income tax, uh, followed by corporate income taxes, which is levied on the income of corporation, with very few taxpayers actually being subjected to personal income tax. Um, however, even when we look at pay as you earn uh, and, and corporate income tax, uh, much of the contribution to these tax handles comes from a limited number of large taxpayers. Another common characteristic is the high economic re relevance of the hard to tax sectors, uh, such as agriculture. Uh, these are sectors which are important source of employment, but generally contribute very little revenue because they, they are very informal, or the average dimension of economic actor is so small that they do not qualify for, for a tax threshold. Now, while most revenue authorities are better funded nowadays than they were 20 years ago, 
they are often still facing important financial constraint, as well as the scarcity of qualified personnel within the labor pool of their country, especially for specific duties which are becoming more and more important, such as auditors of capable of tackling returns from multinational corporations. Now, all revenue authorities in low-income countries are under pressure to increase revenue mobilization in order for the state to be able to provide more and better services and reduce the dependence on foreign aid. Um, however, any effort to increase enforcement for a particular tax handle or on a particular taxpayer group is usually met by some form of resistance. Uh, so the, the strategy which will actually be pursued by any revenue authority to increase revenue mobilization will depend on a few different factors, uh, such as where the economic interest of the country elite lies, how much funding does the revenue authority have and which departments are better staffed, uh, and how much support and for which function uh, are revenue authorities receiving from international donors and international financial institutions. Often, and for very understandable reason, higher priority will be dedicated to less contentious reforms rather than those that have a higher potential to mobilize revenue, as less contentious reform are more likely to be brought to completion and a reform which is left uh, half-baked uh, will not uh, actually lead to any change in, in revenue mobilization. Uh, so what are the different reform options which are currently on the menus of most tax administration? Uh, one which is often pursued uh, is to increase the number of taxpayers through registration campaigns, uh, which usually target small and informal businesses. Uh, these registration campaigns are seen as a way to expand the tax net by bringing in new taxpayer and reducing unfair competition from informal businesses. Uh, while there is currently not that much evidence on the effect of this registration campaign, uh, what seems to be clear for what we currently know is that this strategy is not likely to generate much revenue as registering many taxpayers that have very little tax liability uh, increases the cost of administering taxes and following this taxpayer more than the actual contribution that this taxpayer as an aggregate can, can lead to. Uh, at the same time, many of the newly registered taxpayers also exhibit very low compliance with their tax obligation uh, so that they often do not file any tax return at all. Uh, the somehow opposite strategy is instead to focus on the better off. So both high net worth individuals and professionals such as lawyers, dentists or engineers. Um, while the potential tax contribution of this individual is much higher than that of small informal businesses, it is often very complex to pursue them, uh, given that they are much better connected politically and economically to the country's elite, so that there could be political resistance from, uh, from the elites in, in the taxation of, of some of these actors, they might as well be uh, some of these actors. Uh, makes makes this type of reform fairly complex. Uh, the type of assets that, that this individual own also make it necessary to gain access to a variety of different sources of data from the tax administration, such as lender registries or, or bank accounts. Uh, and this is also uh, fairly complex to obtain. Uh, regardless of these difficulties, however, one must note that taxation of the better off has been receiving more attention over the last few years in low-income countries and that this is unlikely to decrease uh, given the need of increasing mobilization in the wake of the current pandemic. Now, another common trend uh, which, which has been taking place across um, the majority of low-income countries 
is the automation of tax collection, uh, which will be covered uh, in this lecture too, uh, and uh, which could be very important in reducing compliance costs for taxpayer, as well as in reducing face-to-face -face interaction, uh, which are also behind uh, the uh, many occasions for, for corruptive behavior from uh, both taxpayers and tax officers. Um, however, introducing new information and technology systems, while potentially very effective, is also a very lengthy and costly process, often spanning a few years, and then requiring a lot of coordination within the revenue authorities to sustain the reform effort, as well as a lot of dedication from staff. Uh, at times, uh, some of these reforms might also face internal resistance within the revenue authorities themselves as they encroach on practices which uh, might have give rise to personal rent by some tax officer that would prefer to maintain a more ad hoc form of administration of taxes. Uh, taxpayers' outreach, so both uh, edu taxpayers' education uh, on their tax obligation as well as sensitization on the role that revenue plays in promoting the growth of the countries are also becoming more common. Uh, the idea behind this type of effort is that if taxpayers understood better what their obligations are and what their revenue contributes to, then they will be more likely to voluntarily comply with their tax obligation. Uh, however, as of now, we still have fairly limited evidence on the actual impact of, of this type of outreach activity. Finally, it's also useful to mention that uh, tackling avoidance strategy of multinational cooperation is becoming more and more important. Uh, many uh, of these avoidance strategies uh, are fairly complex to, uh, to evaluate or, or to actually identify in many cases, uh, so that the automatic exchange of information and dedicated auditing are the two avenues which most revenue authorities in low-income countries are trying to pursue. Uh, these uh, type of activity are, however, very requiring in terms of staff time and staff skills, uh, so that there's been quite a bit of attention from various donor agencies and international financial institutions in providing support to revenue authorities to increase their capacity uh, to run these functions. To conclude this section of the lecture, uh, what we can say is that there is no single policy that can be seen as the silver bullet to increase tax revenue, or one policy that must be the priority in every given context. Uh, all of the above mentioned strategies have their merits, but will also face some obstacle and will only be successful if a particular series of things actually happen. So that careful consideration must be given to the specific environment of each, of each given country to understand which one is more likely to be implemented beginning to the end and to actually have some impact on, on the tax structures. Uh, many of these strategies also require coordination across different institutional actors, such as ministries of finance, central banks, land registries, and other state institutions. Uh, in many cases, uh, these organizations might have diverse and competing interests to that of the tax authority. They might have their own financial uh, issues to face, their own staffing issues to face, uh, so that coordination across such a variety of institutional actors is not always easy. Finally, it must also be kept in mind that reforming a tax system takes quite a bit of time as reforms are long to plan, often long to implement, and to be successful, they require the sustained support by tax administrators and the political class in general. Even when such a support is present, uh, it might actually take some time uh, before results are seen. This will only deliver in the medium run, uh, so that uh, 
the tax authority could still be under a lot of pressure uh, to deliver tax revenue increases um, in a much quicker time frame than that that could be allowed uh, by the actual natural life of, of a reform project. Hello everyone, I am Fabrizio Santoro. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the International Center for Tax and Development, and I'm happy to be here today to guide you through this section on data, technology, and tax administration. So to start off, we all know that tax administrations in low-income countries and the African continent in particular are quickly moving towards digitalization. They're increasingly using technology to automate, integrate their own functioning, their own processes. This shift has been somehow reinforced by the pandemic uh, and the need to reduce social interactions between taxpayers and tax officials. Now, for the sake of this presentation, but conceptually more broadly, we can distinguish between more inward and more outward facing technological innovations. Inward facing technological innovations refers to how tax administration are using technology to improve their own functioning. And we can label this set of uh, innovation as integrated and automated tax management systems. This is a full package of technological innovations which aim at boosting internal uh, data processing management and data gathering capacity uh, within tax administration. On the other hand, outward facing technological innovations refer to uh, that set of services, of digital services that tax administration uh, are offering to taxpayers. And we will particularly focus on electronic tax filing and electronic payments of taxes, as well as electronic fiscal devices for, for sellers, for traders. On top of that, uh, it's also fair to say that um, we are seeing an increasing debate on the potential of, a, of, a, of a new digital options uh, brought by uh, recent developments in technology. And they uh, could they, they refer to the potential of data from digital financial services, such as data from mobile money, uh, the potential of digital merchant payments, as well as the potential of digital ID systems for tax administration. And this is quite hot topic in, in tax research and in, in, in policy in the policy debate, uh, but very little uh, has been produced in this sense. Now let's try to understand um, which uh, is the actual potential of data and technology for tax administration and for taxpayers. On one hand, IT could bring concrete benefits to tax administration, first of all, by providing new data. Uh, now, as you know, tax administration are becoming more and more data centric, data intensive uh, organization. They heavily depend on the quality of data that they could gather uh, in order to enforce compliance. Uh, in this sense, there is strong beliefs that IT could improve the quality and quantity of such data. Relatedly, technology could also more directly improve the core functions of revenue authorities. Technology could help revenue authorities identifying, tracking, and then registering taxpayers. Uh, just think about uh, how uh, better data could uh, improve the quality of taxpayer registries. On top of that, technology could help revenue authorities in monitoring compliance, and that could take place through more adequate data sharing, automatic cross-checking of information, or audits which are more heavily relying on data. More broadly, technology could also help streamlining uh, everyday operations of revenue authorities, improve the management of data, and overall increase the transparency and effectiveness of uh, the, uh, the core uh, processes of tax administration. 
At the same time, um, technology um, holds great potential for taxpayers as well. Um, there is a strong uh, argument that technology would help reduce compliance costs of taxpayers, which is uh, which refer to the burden the taxpayer face when complying with tax uh, law. Imagine uh, switching from manual filing to electronic filing. That's uh, thought to bring uh, some more uh, benefits in terms of uh, reducing compliance costs. At the same time, through technology, taxpayers could access to improved service. Uh, just think about accessing web portals or online tools offered by tax administration, um, which would facilitate taxpayers' lives in, uh, in, in dealing with their tax matters. This could eventually improve the, the whole taxpayer experience and also, uh, why not, improve record keeping. Again, if taxpayers have access to a unified uh, online account where all their transactions with the, or interactions with the revenue authorities are uh, logged, then that would eventually um, improve record keeping uh, for, for the sake of taxpayers. On top of that, uh, technology would increase the transparency of the rural tax system and then, of course, the trust that taxpayers uh, have uh, with regards to the tax collector, as well as in, a, in accountability, especially if effective feedback mechanisms are put in place, embedded in those technological options. At the end of the day, there is a strong um, conviction that all these factors would combine together to boost tax morale to improve taxpayers' willingness to comply. And then, of course, that would translate in actual uh, filing behavior, in improvement in, in filing behavior. Now, I want to guide you through uh, a first set of practical examples. Um, in, this, in this set, we're going to focus on the potential of data, while in the second one, we will look at more concrete examples of uh, technological applications uh, in, in, uh, in, in the tax system. In this case, talking about data, we will uh, go through uh, the case studies from Rwanda and Ethiopia, which highlight how high quality data is, is, is crucial for the tax administration to uh, perform their, their, their core function. So the first case study, the one from Rwanda, uh, focuses on data from value added tax, uh, VAT. As you know, VAT is a quite sophisticated tax that also produces lots of data which would gather into the, tax, uh, into the systems of tax administration. And also electronic billing machines which are linked to uh, the VAT also produce uh, even a uh, larger amount of data on a daily basis. The key research question in this sense is whether this data is fully exploited by revenue authorities for enforcement and for other functions. Um, in order to address this question, um, we run a specific study on Rwanda. And this is basically what we refer here as Mascagneto 2019. Um, it was a fairly um, straightforward type of analysis. We, we, we basically had a look at the quality of VAT data as um, collected by the Rwanda Revenue Authority. The first set of results here uh, is that discrepancies are widespread in VAT data from, from Rwanda and, and we also believe from many other countries. Now, first of all, we uh, witness uh, a large amount of internal discrepancies, internal inconsistencies. And what we call internal discrepancies are those discrepancies that arise when we match VAT returns from a given taxpayers and uh, the EBM data coming from that very same taxpayer. Now, uh, at least in theory, uh, a seller which files his VAT return every month or every quarter would then declare in that return a given amount of sales, right? Uh, then we, of, of course, that amount of sales should be the same as that reported by uh, his or her 
very own electronic billing machine. And that's the type of comparison we did. We compared the, uh, the amount of um, activity of business transactions reported by uh, the machines with that uh, reported by the uh, self-reported by the taxpayer when it, when it was time to declare for VAT. Well, taxpayers' own records are highly inconsistent. In 43% of the cases, the uh, amount of sales reported by uh, the machines were was different than that declared by taxpayers. The second set of discrepancies is what we call uh, external discrepancies. And in this, uh, in this particular case, what we compare are pair of uh, buyers and sellers in a given period, say over a month, uh, for the same set of transactions, of course. Uh, again, at least in, th at least in theory, uh, both buyers and sellers would report when filing their VAT returns, the same amount of, uh, of, uh, of transactions um, that's happened between them in, in that given period. However, even more strikingly, when doing that comparison between what buyers and sellers report, well, we uh, realize um, that discrepancies are even more widespread. Only 20% of buyers sellers pair match in, in the sense that they uh, report the same information. For all the others, 80%, uh, the, the amount reported is, is, is different, is simply different. And in most cases, buyers even tend to uh, declare less uh, purchases made from, uh, from, from sellers than what they, the sellers are doing in terms of declaring their sales. So, the paper is available online, of course, but this is just an, an example of how um, how much inaccuracy there could be in uh, in in, uh, in, uh, in such you know powerful and potential uh, potentially um, powerful data, which is the one from VAT. The second set of results comes from Ethiopia mm -hmm. and instead looks again at gaps in data from pay as you and returns and VAT. So what the others uh, document um, in Ethiopia is that a strikingly large portion of employees uh, from both the public and the private sectors basically do not have a TIN, a taxpayer identification number. And at the same time, most of pay as earn data are available only at the aggregated employer level data, uh, at, the, at an employer level. There was no, there's no much information at the employee level. And that's mostly because employees seem not to have a taxpayer identification number, which is uh, the, the most basic information that revenue authorities must have in order to track their own uh, taxpayer uh, base. At the same time, um, the authors uh, from Ethiopia also somehow did, uh, did something similar in terms of, of looking at VAT data than what done in Rwanda. And they document how uh, in 60% of the cases, uh, when comparing VAT uh, returns and profit tax uh, returns, the amount of sales reported by the same taxpayer uh, was different. And they also show how uh, this link to the um, discussion we're going to have in a bit, they also show how electronic fiscal device helped helps taxpayers in uh, in uh, more in reporting their sales more accurately. So again, uh, as we shown in Rwanda, even in this case, at least in theory, uh, taxpayers would declare the same amount of sales in their profit tax returns and in their VAT returns. But for some reason, that doesn't ha not, doesn't happen in the majority of the cases. As you can see, these are quite straightforward exercise, uh, which could be replicated potentially in every country, and which would quickly give you an, an assessment of the main gaps in the data. At this point, there are a number of broader key messages that we can draw from the existing literature. First of all, administrative complexity and weak capacity in terms of resources prevent tapping the full potential of VT related data and data from other technological solutions. Now, those discrepancies that I showed you in the previous slides uh, hints to tax evasion, hints to um, strategic taxpayer decision to avoid uh, remitting, disclosing their full income for tax purposes. And we also, I mean, the elders document that 
closing those gaps in the data would significantly uh, boost revenue. Uh, in the case of Rwanda, we are talking about $100 million revenue gain by closing those discrepancies with PAT data. And um, other studies from Ethiopia and Uganda, uh, again, document uh, the, the, the large amount of extra revenues that could be gathered by closing those gaps. That's not happening due to uh, uh, intrinsic challenges at uh, the administrative level and in terms of uh, having the resources to automatically spot those discrepancies. The second key message is that lack of interinstitutional cooperation exacerbates issues around data access and sharing. And that's something happening probably everywhere, uh, but that has been documented in Ethiopia and Malawi. Often, uh, institutions, and I'm talking about revenue authorities and other external government uh, bodies, do not communicate uh, with each other, do not share uh, uh, the, their own data um, for a number of reasons, political to technical reasons. That severely limits the potential of, 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 of information that could be gathered by uh, data sharing activities. The third key message is that often <clears throat> the existence of parallel manual and digital practices within tax administration end up duplicating efforts in, and, and making it even more challenging to run systematic analysis. Again, it's something that's been documented in, uh, in Malawi and Uganda. In an ideal scenario, tax administration have to turn uh, to digital completely, uh, leaving behind any uh, error-prone manual practice. On top of that, as in the case of nil filing, revenue authorities are somehow responsible for creating confusion in, in, in filing patterns, which has repercussion in the quality of tax data. Um, and in the list of references, there is um, a reference to this paper that we wrote on, uh, on nil filing, which is that phenomenon by which taxpayers report zero uh, business activity, zero taxable income and zero tax payable. A quite common uh, behavior which would uh, somehow uh, affect the quality of tax returns data because you will see a lot of zeros. Now, we, we, we try to understand better what lies behind these mechanisms uh, and we uh, notice that the revenue authority could have, could somehow be responsible for that by aggressive um, mass registration campaigns which end up bloating taxpayer registries with taxpayers with, that are not operative and would then end up just uh, remitting zero. Now, uh, the second set of practical examples refers to uh, what we call electronic fiscal devices, EFDs, which are technology that <clears throat> tax administration are increasingly offering and often mandating for taxpayers or sellers. As you can see from this list of references, there is an in increasing uh, literature uh, being produced on the effectiveness and the impacts of such tools. And we can learn a lot uh, from that. Now, in terms of the potential of electronic fiscal devices, <clears throat> we could start, for example, by mentioning the World Bank survey study on Ethiopian firms, which highlights some key benefits from EFD's adoption. Um, Ethiopian firms that adopted these tools report that they had less opportunity for theft, that they had access to updated and easily available information on sales. So, you know, improving their uh, awareness and their record keeping. They report that it, it, it got easier for them to comply with tax requirements. And of course, they had better, again, better controls on, uh, on sales and inventory. More quantitative studies also show that um, adoption of AFDs bring some positive tangible impacts on uh, domestic renormalization, <clears throat> and that has been documented in Ethiopia and in Rwanda, especially for smaller firms. Um, Follow-up studies, always from Ethiopia and Rwanda, also show how uh, adoption of such tools has a strong um, benefit in terms of um, reporting tax returns more accurately through better record keeping. 
And then uh, there is also a separate strand of research uh, trying to understand the role of customers in solving the last mile problem of VAT compliance through the <coughs> request of, uh, of, of receipts uh, which are generated by electronic fiscal devices. But what about uh, the challenges and shortcomings? Well, uh, these have been documented as well uh, in those studies that I mentioned. Um, first of all, uh, we know that often using such technology could be complex and burdensome for taxpayers, and increasing evidence has been produced in Rwanda, Kenya, and uh, Tanzania. Often, inputting, inputting mistakes due to challenges in usage, in usage would have repercussion on the data quality. Taxpayers, especially less experienced ones, tend to make mistakes in using the uh, electronic billing machines, and that would then communicate and share uh, wrong data uh, with the authority. There's also this aspect of equity, which is quite important. Um, <clears throat> we seem to understand now that smaller firms could also be those struggling more to take up and properly use this technology, uh, as shown, for example, in, in Rwanda or in a cross-country study from Hilmats and College uh, from Nepal, Ukraine and South Africa. The smaller taxpayers have much more troubles in, in, in appropriately using this technology, and so they end up uh, facing higher costs. Also, there is this story of ineffective enforcement again due to limits and, and gaps in how tax administration makes use of data. Uh, for example, data produced for, from the electronic data machines could be of inadequate quality and then not be uh, perfectly useful for monitoring purposes. At the same time, there's still little IT capacity to unlock the full potential of data from, from such machines. Now, this last slide tends to draw some more general conclusion on the potential of technology. The key um, takeaway here is that technology alone is not enough. Technology is just a tool which could be used in a good or in a bad way. Uh, Importantly, there are crucial prerequisites uh, that tax administration should uh, somehow observe so that they could fully benefit from the potential of data and technology. Which are these prerequisites? Well, uh, first of all, um, tax administration need adequate investment in technical capacity, uh, in staff, software, procedures. Something is, of course, uh, quite costly for budget constraints institution. They also uh, need to undergo through a change in management and mindset, and the whole organizational reengineering as driven by uh, a given technological journey. A journey that should be geared towards data sharing and cooperation across departments and institutions. <clears throat> in this context, um, it is fair to assume that tax officials, some tax officials, could resist the adoption of new uh, digital solutions because they will then lose privileges from previous discretionary manual system. Importantly, tax administration could do their best to facilitate taxpayer take up and usage of new technology. Uh, for any technological solution to be successful, it must be adequately taken up by the broader population. And, and that suggests the need for mass trainings and uh, a broader service-oriented approach. Then there's also this aspect on uh, the role of uh, the regulatory legal framework, which needs to be taken into account when uh, embarking into a new technological journey. Mm, tax code in low-income countries seems to be still silent about specific regulations around the usage of, of e electronic services. Often, for example, um, there is no uh, requirement of, uh, of using a given technology in, in a mandatory fashion, and so the European authorities could not enforce that. Finally, uh, any technological uh, innovation should be backed by strong political support for nationwide institutional reforms. Uh, political support here in the figure of national leaders, for example, is of paramount importance so that 
not only the tax administration itself, but the whole uh, mm, the, the government as a whole could uh, coherently embark into a, um, into the same uh, technological journey. In so doing, we uh, ended our, our discussion on data and technology. Here you can see some additional references for your per usual. <clears throat> and um, thanks again for watching, and I hope uh, this uh, has been uh, of help for you. Thank you.